God, why did they have to stop segregation? Mr. Smith, the answer is DP over DT equals 200. Well, it seems you are correct, but black kids don't have any bit of brain in their heads. Hey, I'm Aurora, and this is the story of how I was able to help one of my closest friends get revenge on our racist and creepy teacher. It's quite an interesting story, really, and I'm happy to share it with you all. So, I first met Jalen when I was a sophomore, but he'd just started high school. About half of the school year had ended and he'd just transferred in from another school. My first impression was that Jalen was a pretty quiet kid and he was very lonely, so I decided to go up to him and start a conversation. Hey, I'm Aurora, what's your name? I'm Jalen. Um, can I ask you how I can get to my next class? Sure, I'll even walk you if you like. He was a very nice kid and soon enough we traded numbers and even worked on some homework assignments together. Because Jalen was incredibly smart, he was ahead of his grade and was in my math class, which was calculus. He also just treated everybody with kindness, and I think that's what gained everybody, including the teacher's respect. But when the next year started, everything changed. Jalen and I found out that we were in the same class, which was awesome. The downside was that the teacher was the most horrid man you could ever meet. I've got a lot to say about him, so hang in there. This man's name was Mr. Smith, and he was just not a pleasant man in general. First of all, his classwork was just insanely difficult, and only the smartest of the smartest kids in the class could just barely pass with an A. He was incompetent when it came to communication with the students as well. Overall, people did not like him, but they had no choice but to act like they at least tolerated his existence, since the teachers were oblivious to his personality. I'd heard about Mr. Smith from his former students, but nothing could ever prepare me and Jalen for what we were going to experience. Right as the school year started, Mr. Smith told Jalen to sit at a desk in the far back of the room, which was already weird. Jalen and I shot glances at each other when Mr. Smith did this for the only other dark-skinned student as well. Hmm. He then started to seat us in a very abnormal pattern. The white kids were in the front, with Asians and Latino students in the middle of the class. However, Mr. Smith put me in the front of the class, but I was Asian. Okay, strange. I decided to not dwell too much on this seating arrangement and see how Mr. Smith was going to teach first. And boy, was the first experience insane. I'm Mr. Smith. We are jumping right into our first lesson. Mr. Smith, I think you're on unit three. Too bad. You keep talking when I'm trying to teach. I'm glad I put the bad kid in the back. I knew you'd be up to no good, but the other kids are welcome to ask questions. I was completely flabbergasted. Did this teacher really have the audacity to call Jalen a bad student because of confusion? And the way he decided to skip the most crucial parts of the course was crazy. For the rest of the period, the kids asked him questions while he answered them nicely, but completely ignored Jalen and the other girl, Michaela, who tried so many times to even get his attention. And after his entire lesson, in which half the class got lost on, he gave us a pop quiz. We got our results immediately, and to my surprise, I failed miserably. This wasn't possible, I'd been trying my best to pay attention the whole time. I began asking the class around. Every student in the class got low Ds or Cs, while Jalen and Michaela had low Fs. I reviewed my answers with other students, and despite getting almost the same answers as them, I got a lower grade than them. Jalen's answers were mostly all correct, but the mark said that he'd failed. This just didn't add up. The next day, Michaela immediately transferred out of the class, which was good for her. Unfortunately, the school didn't let Jalen do the same for whatever reason. Mr. Smith just got worse and worse as the year went on. Mr. Smith would blatantly say that he didn't like the way Jalen talked or looked at him. The teacher would also comment on how Jalen probably cheated his way into the class, because apparently, Kids like him weren't capable of having a higher IQ. It's stupid reasoning, honestly. Kids that look like you are always stupid. You can always tell from the skin. Shut up and sit down before I give you a referral. Now, wasn't this just insane? Mr. Smith continued to give other kids passing grades while Jalen and I's grades suffered. But while Mr. Smith berated Jalen constantly, he seemed to have nothing against me. One day, I decided to talk to my teacher and ask him what was going on. Mr. Smith, 
Can I ask you why I got a 25% on this assignment? I triple checked and my answers were correct. Well, you seem like a very nice girl. I'll see if I can change your grade. And what about Jalen? He got a perfect score as well, but you gave him a zero. Who cares about Jalen? You and I both know that black kids like him don't make it anywhere in life. You're a pretty little girl. Keep away from that boy. He will just ruin you. I'll change your grade for you just because you're special and so beautiful. Don't tell anybody. Well, that definitely sounded threatening. This just kept going and going and going as the days rolled by. My grades were changed, but Mr. Smith also started acting a little weirder towards me, but more racist towards Jalen. Jalen, I told you to stop talking right this instant. Sir, that was Mike, not me. Mike is a good kid. This behavior is only going to get you into prison later on. You've probably already been in juvenile hall a few times. God, why did they have to stop segregation? Mr. Smith, the answer is DP over DT equals 200. Well, it seems you are correct, but black kids don't have any bit of brain in their heads. I'm issuing you a detention from cheating off my other students. Oh, hell nah. This was getting too far. And why didn't any other student try and speak up for Jalen? Jalen and I decided to confront Mr. Smith right after class. When the bell rang, the other students quickly got up and left while Jalen and I waited. I got up and walked to Mr. Smith's desk. Mr. Smith, I think treating Jalen like trash and underestimating his abilities is a really scummy move, especially since you're a teacher and Jalen is one of your students. Sir, I'm sorry if you feel any sort of discomfort towards me, but I am simply trying to learn like everybody else. How dare you think it is right to talk to me? Don't you get it? I see you as nothing. You will be nothing. You will do nothing. You will eat nothing. You will make nothing. Why would I waste my time on someone that I know is going to fail in life anyway? Get out before I call in security. But Aurora, wait. Jalen quickly left the room in anger. I was very confused, but I obeyed. I was still fuming from everything that the math teacher had said to my friend, and I was just about ready to punch him square in the face. Maybe I could go talk to a counselor instead to sort out this situation. How many times have I told you not to stand up for that black kid? He's only going to drag you down. Maybe I'll have to punish a naughty girl like you. You'd like that, huh? What the hell? I immediately felt weirded out and made some lame excuse before leaving. I knew that Jalen and I had to take this into our own hands. So not only was Mr. Smith an ignorant and racist being, but he was also a creep. I went over to his house and we started thinking of a plan. What should we do? Um, I'm not sure at all. Wait. I watched curiously as Jalen ran out of the room, coming back a minute later with a pen and a tiny phone. Um, how's this gonna help? Well, this pen actually has a microphone inside it, and I can easily hide the phone so that I won't get caught. I can videotape, and maybe you can have the pen so the microphone can pick his insults up better. Sounds good. Where do you even find a microphone pen? I have my ways. We had our plan ready, and we were definitely going to get our evidence. Better sooner than later. The next day, we walked into class and waited for it to start. I turned on the pen Jalen gave me, and he started the camera. Mr. Smith walked in and almost immediately started throwing his insults. Mr. Jalen, the color of your skin really infuriates me sometimes. But you might be a little lucky today. I'm going to be pounding on the whole class for yesterday's quiz results. Although Mr. Smith claimed that he was going to bully the whole class today, he quickly switched back to harassing Jalen again. Jalen, how does a black kid get 85% on a math test? Haven't I warned you enough not to cheat? They should make physical punishments legal again. That way, I could teach you a lesson like how they taught your ancestors. What? Mr. Smith, that's a really unconventional thing to say. You need to stop racially profiling me and being racist. All I'm trying to do is just learn. Oh my goodness! Now the minority comes crying and blaming somebody else for their own faults. I know damn well you cheat, but you play the victim card so you could get me in trouble. Mr. Smith. Why don't you get on the football team and do something useful with yourself rather than trying to be something you're not? Stupid kid. Shut up before I send you to the counselors again. Obviously, Jalen and I were absolutely fuming. For the rest of the class, 
I recorded a few more of our teacher's very bold statements. And as soon as class ended, the two of us ran out to the front office. We plugged in the phone and microphone to the secretary's computer, showing her that we needed to see the principal immediately. She let us go in since the principal was available at the moment. We walked in with the evidence and explained to Principal Lacey everything that Mr. Smith had done. She appeared a little shocked at first, but upon seeing the video and hearing what he said, she was just as mad by the end of our story. Principal Lacey signed us out of school early and allowed us to just leave, which was nice. She promised that she'd help do something about it. The next day, Jalen and I walked slowly to math class. We were afraid of what we'd see. To our surprise, a notice on the door stated that Mr. Smith would be out of the office for a few weeks for emergency reasons. We looked at each other. Was he finally going to get kicked from the school? We soon heard around that Principal Lacey had walked straight into Mr. Smith's next class and begun playing the video in front of the whole class. Mr. Smith turned totally red and panicked while trying to explain himself. One of the students even recorded the situation and what happened was exactly what the rumor was. It was hilarious. Mr. Smith ended up getting fired with his teaching license revoked. I also told people about his creepy behavior towards me, and other students also spoke about him being creepy towards them. Nothing was done about this situation, but because everybody knew what a terrible person he was, many parents protested him about even living in our city. We ended up getting a new teacher, and he was the best person ever. He was compassionate to the whole class and helped us get good grades, he even specially helped Jalen get A's on the grades that Mr. Smith had messed up purposefully. Mr. Smith ended up moving to a small town to try and at least tutor kids, but the rumor spread around so much that he ended up jobless. We heard the wife was so pissed and divorce him. Taking along their five years old son, Mr. Smith now is depressed and jobless. Jalen and I have gotten closer than ever, and this year, we are applying for college. Sophomore year was a crazy journey, but we made it through with some happy outcomes. Thanks for listening to my story, and what do you think? My name is Henry, and I wanted to share the story of my life and the struggles that I've had. I grew up as an only child, and my parents were amazing. They were quite wealthy, and I lived a very happy and comfortable life. That is until they were driving home after work one night. They both worked in the same office building, and so they carpooled to work, and unfortunately there was a terrible storm, and they lost control of the car, and got into a terrible accident, and died. I was only eight at the time, and I barely understood what was going on, but I knew that my world would never be the same. The day after the funeral, my father's brother came and told me that I would be moving in with him and his family. I was so shell-shocked that I didn't even question it and just went with him. When we got to his home, he showed me to my room, which was in the basement. Again, I didn't question anything, but then he left me down there. Eventually, I got hungry and went upstairs to find something to eat, and when I did, I was scolded. Um, what are you doing up here? I'm hungry. I came up to see if could have something to eat. Seriously? Fine, here, take this apple and go back downstairs. I'll let you know when you can come up. I hadn't eaten in several hours and all he could give me was an apple. I didn't question it though, as I was still very upset. And so I took the meager snack and went downstairs. But after an hour, I was hungry again. And so I tried to sneak upstairs again as quietly as I could, only to find the door to the basement locked from the other side. As I tried to open it, I panicked. My uncle had locked me in the basement. The next morning, I woke up to the sound of my aunt calling down that it was time for breakfast. I was so hungry that I forgot that they had locked me down there and ran upstairs and joined them in the kitchen. At the table were my aunt and uncle and my cousin Terry. There was bacon, eggs, sausage, toast, fruit salad, and pancakes all piled high on plates. I couldn't wait to dig in, but then my aunt looked at me sternly and told me to sit down. Don't get any funny ideas. You are allowed to have two pieces of toast and a single piece of bacon. That's it. But I'm so hungry. Could I please have more? You want more? Then get a job and buy yourself more. We aren't giving you more than you deserve. My cousin didn't say anything and just laughed at me while shoving food in his mouth. 
I really didn't understand why they were treating me like this. After all, my parents had just passed away, and we were family. It confused me, but that routine became the new normal for me. Every meal, my aunt and uncle would give me only the barest amounts of food, and when I wasn't in school, they would confine me to the basement. After a week of barely eating enough, I decided to get a part-time job at a grocery store. It wasn't a lot of money, but it allowed me to buy enough food so that I was no longer starving. The owner was a kind older man that spent his breaks drawing in a journal. One day, I asked if I could see it, and he handed it over to me. My eyes nearly popped out of my head when I saw how amazing an artist he was, and I asked him if he could show me how he drew so well. He agreed, and so we began spending our breaks together drawing. At first, I wasn't very good. But the more I practiced, the better I got until my drawings were as beautiful as my boss's. When I was forced to stay in the basement at home, I spent most of my time either studying or drawing or painting. I did my best to keep my artwork hidden, as I didn't know what my aunt and uncle would do if they found them. One day though, I came home tired from work to find all my artwork in a pile on the kitchen table. What is this garbage? Where did you get all of that? That's my private artwork. I found it in the basement. My father says that I get to burn it all. Wait, what did you say? Yes, we promised him that he could have the honor of destroying it. It's a waste of time to make such things. Now go to your room. Sad and angry, I ran downstairs and cried myself to sleep. In the morning, I looked outside and saw a pile of ashes on the patio and knew that my cousin had destroyed all my hard work. Sadly, it went on like that for many years until I turned 18. On my birthday, my aunt and uncle called me upstairs. I knew that it wouldn't be good news, but I had no idea just how bad it would be. Now that you're 18, you're an adult and we don't have to support you anymore. We'll let you pack your clothes and a few belongings, but then you need to leave. Wait, what? You're kicking me out? But where will I go? I have no money to find a place to live. That really isn't our problem. Now hurry up. Terry wants to make the basement into his personal apartment. And just like that, I was homeless and living on the street. I did have a little bit of money from working at the grocery store, but I knew that that wouldn't last long. Desperate, I went to my boss and asked him for advice. Your aunt and uncle did what? They kicked me out. Do you know of any place where I can stay? I could tell that he was disgusted by my aunt's and uncle's actions, and he offered for me to stay in the apartment above the store. He even told me that, so long as I stayed in school, that I could stay there rent-free as well. I was so grateful that I of course took him up on the offer. Since I lived so close to work, I began to pick up more shifts as well, which allowed me to do more with my money and under the advice of my boss. I took some college art courses and was able to put some of my paintings in a local gallery. To my surprise, they were only there for a couple days when they sold quickly. And if that wasn't good enough, people began asking for more of my work. When I wasn't working in the grocery store, I spent all my time painting or drawing, and I couldn't keep up. People began coming from other cities to buy my artwork, and before long I was making a lot of money. My artwork was featured in the local papers and on the news, and before long I was forced to quit my job at the grocery store in order to keep up with the demand for my art. My former boss completely understood and wished me luck as I moved out of the apartment and used some of the money that I had made as a down payment for a house. Not long after I moved in though, I received a letter in the mail saying that I owed a credit card company over $30,000 and that if I didn't pay immediately, that they would seize my house. Confused, I contacted a lawyer and he was able to prove that I hadn't signed up for the card, nor had I ever used it. However, that didn't stop the company from harassing me and trying to get money from me. I was so annoyed that I hired a private investigator to find out who had opened the card in my name and who had spent all that money. He tracked the card all the way back to my uncle. Apparently, my cousin Terry had developed a gambling problem, and my aunt and uncle had to use up all their money to cover his debts, and were beginning to get desperate. In the end, they opened several credit cards in my name and forged my signature on them. I immediately contacted the police and told them what my aunt and uncle had done and pressed charges against them. There was no way that I was going to let them get away with ruining my life on account of their terrible son. On top of that, I also sued them for ruining my credit score and for impersonating me. A month later, a judge awarded me over $40,000 in compensation, which forced my aunt and uncle to sell their house in order to not only pay me, but also to pay off a portion of the debt that their son's gambling had caused. The bad news didn't end there for them, though. 
The police had finished their investigation and found that not only did my aunt and uncle commit fraud, but my cousin did as well, and all three of them would be going away for a long time to prison. My uncle even had the audacity to call me up and beg me to drop the charges. Hey Henry, listen. I know that we've had our differences, but the police say that if you drop the charges, that we will still have to pay back the money, but that we won't have to go to prison. So please just call them up and let them know that this was all just a big misunderstanding. There is no misunderstanding. You stole money and then tried to put me on the hook for bailing you out. You've made this choice and now you'll have to deal with it. But Henry, I raised you. We're family. Can't you see fit to helping us out? We're not family. You treated me like garbage and then kicked me out as soon as you could. I wouldn't help you if you were the last person on earth. For that matter, why were you always so mean to me when we're supposedly family? You're just like your father, you selfish loser. And the reason we hate you is because you aren't really family. Your father was adopted and that makes you literally nothing to me. Well, at least I know now why the three of you were such jerks. Well, I hope that your stay in prison is as unpleasant as the way that you treated me. That's when I hung up the phone and breathed a sigh of relief. Part of me wanted to feel bad, but then I remembered how they had locked me up in their basement for so many years and I instantly felt no regret for pressing charges against them. In the end though, my art career only prospered more and more, and I've been able to not only find myself someone I love, but we are expecting a child as well. Life hasn't always been easy for me, but I'm finally in a place where I'm excited to see what the future has in store for me and my family. Thanks for watching. Please like the video so it can be recommended to others to watch. Oh, hey, how's it going? I'm Lana and my story doesn't exactly come from a book of fairy tales. For about three years now, I've been married to my husband, Sebastian, and it has been such a fever dream. Okay, okay. I did say that my tale wasn't exactly sweet and short from start to finish, and that is true. The relationship almost took a rough crash due to Sebastian's family. My story was far from your basic romance fantasy, and I'll just tell you just what went down with the in-laws. Sebastian and I met at my part-time job back in college, it began with him showing up consistently to my shifts to watch me, and one day he decided to talk to me. I wasn't too comfortable with him at first, but time did its thing. After becoming friends, we soon went on a date after talking for a while. That was the moment that it clicked, and I knew that I'd fallen in love with Sebastian. Sebastian and I had so much in common, and everything about him just made me fall even harder for him. For one, we both enjoyed going to theme parks and loved the same shows. We wrote poems together during our free time, and he loved hearing about whatever I had to say, and we always matched vibes. We were even both majoring in the medical field. When we'd started dating, neither of us had immediately told our parents, as we both had very strict ones. In the end though, I took my boyfriend to my family's for dinner, and they loved and accepted him. Sebastian had called the parents before to inform them he had a girlfriend who was a Filipino. The mom just dropped the call after hearing that. Sebastian was studying to become a psychiatrist. He was also rich from birth, as his family was quite wealthy. Upon hearing this, my parents accepted him a lot more because he was passionate about having a bright future. On the other hand, Sebastian's family was less accepting of us being together. Sebastian asked his parents if he could take me to their home for dinner, and his mom completely flipped. She was frantically asking him, what girlfriend? And lecturing him nonstop, telling him to break up with me. Sebastian was upset by his mom's discouragement, but didn't let that get to him as he continued to date me in secret. Soon, I had graduated from university with my degree in nursing, but of course, Sebastian had a long way to go with his degrees. I soon went through my whole process and became a registered nurse, but Sebastian soon did something amazing. He proposed to me very soon after I started working. I was absolutely thrilled and couldn't wait to start my next big part of life with my no fiance. We weren't going to have the wedding for a good while though, as I wanted Sebastian to focus on his studies. Even then, I was happy to be committed to this early on. Now that my parents somewhat actually accepted Sebastian, I decided to immediately share the news with them. 
Thankfully, they were also just as thrilled as I was. I also told my best friends and alumni from school. I was so happy that everyone was accepting of our relationship. Sebastian and I couldn't wait to plan out our wedding and to have it. Although his schooling kept him quite busy, it didn't stop him from finding time to spend with me every night, even if it was for only an hour or so. Hey baby, what are you doing? Hi, I'm just playing a video game. Cute, let me join. Okay, when do you think we should tell your parents about us? Sweetie, I don't know. I mean, they are my parents. I imagine they'd like to know what's going on with their son. Maybe we can tell them a bit before the wedding. All right then. Of course, I was very nervous, but I had to go through with this. Sebastian's family still loved him very much and deserved to know how his life was, especially now that we're engaged. A few months flew by, and just two months before our set wedding date, Sebastian drove us out two hours to visit his family and share the news. The house was very grand, with a few expensive cars parked in front. I looked at Sebastian anxiously, but he held my hand and we walked to the door together. After he knocked, a woman I could only assume was his mom answered the door. She noticed me immediately, but went in to greet her son first. When I attempted to introduce myself to her, she rolled her eyes very obviously, but allowed me to go inside. I remembered that her name was Mary. Mary escorted us to the couch before leaving and fetching her husband, Derek. How are you? Your name was Lana, correct? Yes, sir. I'm good, thank you. Well, Dad, I have something to announce to you guys. Lana and I are engaged. We've already got a wedding date set and all the preparations have been done. I'm really sorry that this was on such late notice, but we were sure that you and Mom wouldn't be too supportive. What? Are you serious right now? I never approved of you guys to date. This is absolutely absurd. She looks like she sleeps around with guys. How can she be worth your time? Now, Mary, let's not be too harsh. You can't see it in her eyes? The girl is a devil. I can just feel it. And besides, her family isn't even well off. She's just leeching you for money. Mom, can't you see that I love Lana very much? That comment was absolutely unnecessary. We've been together for almost six years now, and these years have been the best of my life. I'm almost at my 30s, and I definitely should not be taking orders from my parents. We're leaving, but you're still invited to come to the wedding if you wish. We can handle it without you, though. Sebastian quickly got up and took my hand, dragging me out of the house. I felt very empty for a bit as we sat in the car. I'm not sure what I was feeling exactly, but I knew that I felt bad for Sebastian. All he wanted was for his parents to love the choices and progress he made in his love life, and they couldn't give him that. I wasn't feeling too insulted, but maybe the slut-shaming did make me feel a bit horrible about myself. I felt my eyes well up with tears, and my fiancé quickly noticed. Honey, don't cry. We will make this all work out. But how? Your parents hate the idea of us being together, so you might not see your mom and dad at your own wedding. You're more important than them at this point. Why don't we go to that bakery place you love? My fiancé's words were comforting, and I decided to listen to him. As the wedding date began to approach, things got more tense as we had to make sure everything was ready, on top of our work and school. The only thing that helped us was getting intimate occasionally. One day while I was at my nursing shift, I got a text from my best friend. She sent over a social media account that was explaining something. I clicked into it, and it was an anonymous user who vowed to expose me for the terrible things I did. I was very confused, but the user had made a few posts. They read things such as, Lana was a tramp who couldn't stop getting with the football team, and she cheated on her boyfriend with four other guys. And even Lana drunk drove and killed an innocent civilian when she was 17. Search it up, we'd never lie. I felt absolutely sick to my stomach. Who could ever come up with such blatant statements like this? There wasn't even solid proof in the posts, just insane claims followed by a long essay describing my so-called crimes in detail. I texted Sebastian about what I'd just discovered and tried not to cry, especially because I was at work. He began accusing me about my morals and I thought that my life was about to crumble before me. After a bit of thinking though, Sebastian texted back, assuring me not to worry about anything. I felt terrible that he believed the posts at first. He was eventually able to figure out the location from where the user posts, and believe it or not, it was in the same area that Sebastian's parents lived. I should have seen that coming earlier. But the two of us were able to report the account for spreading false news and Sebastian called up his parents angrily, demanding that they stop posting on the account. They were equally pissed, 
but they knew this wasn't working, so they did stop. This didn't stop them from sending me threatening texts, though. Finally, it was the day of the wedding and I was extremely excited. Sebastian and I went to the wedding venue where there were people we've hired to help us. They had everything set up and everything looked beautiful. One of the workers led me up to the room where I'd get ready, where my dress would be ready for me, as well as several makeup artists. When I walked in, I was quite surprised to see that my soon-to-be mother-in-law was in the room. She smiled and explained that she, along with Derek, had an apparent change of heart. I felt a bit relieved and sat down so that the makeup artist could get started on their task. Then I heard the door close and thinking that was normal, I continued on with the preparation. When it was time to put on the dress, one of the dressers gasped when she opened the closet door. I turned around and was shocked to find that my gorgeous dress was gone. I frantically called Sebastian and told him that it was missing. He appeared confused that the dress could have just disappeared, but he said that he'd try to help find it. A few minutes later, I hear screaming outside the house. I looked out the windows and saw my dress being absolutely engulfed in flames. This couldn't be happening right now. I ran outside just in time to see a few guys putting out the fire. I began to cry as I held the burned and torn dress. I was wailing as the venue management tried hard to comfort me. Sebastian ran out of the house and he started fuming when he saw what had happened. This was a $4,000 dress and I was going to wear it down the aisle. We looked at each other and our brains put together the pieces at the same time. This had to be the work of Sebastian's mother. But the venue management suggested that we continue on with the wedding. We shrugged and the dressers even decided to come up with something else. I wasn't about to let some jealous people get the better of me. Only an hour had passed and it was finally time for me to walk down the aisle. I did so and everyone was a bit shocked. I had on a black and very fancy dress and in my hands was the dress that my mother-in-law had destroyed. I didn't care, though. I was going to go through with the ceremony. When it was time for the rings to be put on our fingers, the man could not find it in the box at all. Sebastian and I had known again what happened, but just before I was about to break down for the second time, my mom and dad stepped up, giving us their wedding rings. It was such a sweet gesture that I began to cry in front of the whole crowd. They were very moved as well and the ceremony was completed as people started clapping happily. After the wedding, Sebastian took me to a hotel where we got very intimate. I loved how much of a romantic he was and we just laid in each other's arms non-stop. But then, my husband started getting calls on his phone. He rolled his eyes, seeing as it was his mom. She sounded pissed. I just saw your post. What do you mean you actually got married to her? Mom, don't do this right now. You just stole our wedding rings and destroyed Lana's expensive dress. Well, she deserved for that to happen. I can't believe you had a wedding with a black dress. You should have just canceled the wedding altogether. She's just a good-for-nothing loser who's obsessed with cheating, she's stupid, ugly, and I honestly don't even know what you saw in her. Divorce her right now, or I'll shoot her dead with my gun. In fact, I'm already outside your door. Open up. Sebastian immediately hung up. He looked outside the peephole, and sure enough, his mom was approaching. I quickly called the police and we barricaded ourselves inside the bathroom, scared. I won't hurt you, my baby Sebastian, but your little wife really needs to be killed right now. I didn't approve of this, Sebi. Open the door like a good son. Oh God, this was absolutely terrifying. But we didn't say a word and instead waited very patiently while cramped up in the bathroom. After an eternity, the police showed up and caught Mary banging on the door with her gun. Obviously, this looked very threatening, so they detained Mary and told us that we could come out now. Sebastian glanced at me and we began laughing. I had the whole call recorded on my phone, as well as the threats Mary had made outside the door. I posted it to my page, and because I had many friends on the site, the video quickly started getting views. Anyway, everything that happened after this was quite a blur. We were in court against my mother-in-law for her threats against us. Mary was only to be put in jail for six months and was fine to pay the dress and ring as well, but she kept acting rude and getting into trouble, so her sentence always increased little by little. The video got so popular within the next week that we were even interviewed by a small news channel. Mary's daughter were so embarrassed that they cut ties with her, according to one of Sebastian's cousins. Derek has come to apologize a few times, and I accepted his apology but not Mary. I have decided she might never get to see her grandkids. 
When Mary was finally released, I found out that Mary's home was doxxed and people showed up constantly to harass her by throwing eggs at the windows and putting letters criticizing her actions under the door. She was probably living a very depressed life now. To be honest, I'm not even sure why she hated me. Tough for them, I guess. Some of my friends say that what happened to Mary were too harsh, but I don't think so. What are your opinions? My name is Kelly. I'm married to the man of my dreams and living in a beautiful apartment in the city center. We're close to all the action, our work, the nightlife, our friends, and the best shops in the district. We were happy. I and Damien had a son and I was pregnant with our second child. I liked his family. Damien's sisters were great to hang out with and his older brother was like an older brother to me too. I never had siblings growing up, so to find siblings in Damien's family was a blessing. I never knew to expect it. His father was a kind man who was reserved but loved to spoil his children. It wasn't unheard of to go to pay the bill and learn that his father had called ahead and paid for them. It was nice to be a part of a family. The mother, however, was a different story. I can't begin to imagine what Damien was thinking when he settled for you. And I guess there's no going back now, is there? Since you've got yourself knocked up. Damien and I are in love. I don't know why you're so against us. If you don't know, then you won't understand. Just know that being pregnant doesn't mean you can lay about. I have a job. Oh, I see how it is. You think having a job excuses you from household work? You're a wife and a mother. You can't just avoid the work because it's convenient for you. Honestly, what a disgusting work ethic. I could feel my stress levels rising already, but my doctor already warned me against letting myself get worked up. I just chose to ignore her hurtful comments and get on with my work. My company is a publishing house, so I don't need to be in the office every day of the week. The nearer I got to my due date, the more often I chose to work from home. You might have Damien fooled, but I know it's not a real job. You're just on your damned computer all day. I work on my computer, everyone does. Would you like a coffee? Are you trying to kill my godchild before it's even born by drinking coffee? I hated it when she shouted at me, but she seemed to revel in how red my face would get when I was holding back either tears or angry words. It's so unfortunate how plain looking you are. His high school girlfriend was so pretty. She had the nicest hair. I don't know why he'd settle for you. I'm eternally grateful that he's no shallow enough for that to matter. Now coffee, I'm going to have a cucumber water myself. I don't trust you a second to make consumable coffee. I'll do it. That way I can be sure you're not drinking any either. That's fine. It was actually agonizing to have to sit around and listen to her complain about me in whatever way she finds most amusing at the time. It's not always unbearable, but today, Damien is working late, and he'd forgotten to warn me that his mother was going to spend the day as her home was being renovated. If I'd have known, I'd have gone into work. I kept mostly to myself for the rest of the day, but I could hear a lot of movement and muttered obscenities from the next room. She was baiting me, and I wasn't gonna take it. I left her to her mission, and figure it that Damien could handle it. True enough, Damien came home later that evening and complained loudly to his mother about her interfering ways and how she shouldn't just move stuff around the house. Well, I wouldn't have to if she had offered to help. I could tell by the way she said she, like it was a dirty word, that she was talking about me. We've talked about this, mother. She's my wife. I love her. She's as much family to me as you are. Stop treating her like this. Oh, my poor baby. She's turning you against me. Mom, give it a rest, okay? Kelly is a good person. She's a hard worker. And I won't hear any more of your awful rhetoric. Naturally, I hoped that that would be the end of things. But I knew it was too hard for her to go cold turkey on the insults. The next weekend, we all attended her birthday party at a lake house. I kept myself out of the sun. I was seven months pregnant and I didn't want to overheat while carrying around the giant lump on my stomach. Are you just going to hide away in here all day? Take these trays of canapes down to the poolside and be fast. I need you to take these jugs of margarita too. She didn't let me sit down. While everyone else was busy setting up the gazebos and tables, I was going up and down the hill in the heat carrying the food and drinks down. I started to feel tired immediately, but by the fifth trip, it was morphing into sickness. Don't slow down. We've got the guests coming in 30 minutes and everyone is busy. Hurry up. I felt, for the first time, like she wasn't being unreasonable. 
everyone was busy setting up, and I had no business sitting to the side and doing nothing. I wanted to be helpful. I don't feel great. I need to take a rest. Don't you dare. After all the work I've put into this special day, you can't even give up a minute of your time to help? Carry these boxes down, you ungrateful swine. It was the last batch of things she needed me to take down. I thought maybe, if I did this, she would let me rest in peace without having to suffer through her barrage of insults. I've got a headache and my ankles hurt and I feel woozy, but if I can just get this done, then it's okay. I took the box down and put it on the table, but then stumbled. Kelly, are you okay? Goodness, you shouldn't be out in this heat. Come in the shade. Sit down. You look sick. I'll get you some ice water. Sit down. No, no. I need to help. What's going on here? She's been out and working in the heat. She's unsteady on her feet and growing pale. Kelly, what were you thinking? I needed to help. Kelly, Kelly, you lazy lump. Get up here. I've got more stuff you need to carry. Kelly, where are you? Get over here now. Mother, you've been making her work in this heat? Are you serious? She's seven months pregnant. I don't feel very well. If there's any place you want to fall ill, it's with Damien's older brother around. He's a doctor and very caring. He helped me lay down on the bench and put a cooling cloth on my forehead. Unfortunately, it didn't help. Blood started to pour down my legs and I was rushed to the hospital. Mother, you did this. She's ruined my birthday celebration with her histrionics. How dare you? I'm so sorry, Kelly and Damien. There's nothing I can do. Damien's brother explained that due to emotional distress and physical stress, my body couldn't recover. I lost the baby. Mother, you know how dangerous it is to have someone pregnant working so hard. How could you? You should have told me you wanted to stop. I tried. You accused me of being selfish and trying to ruin your day. I did everything you wanted and you ruined my life. How could you? Damien and I were devastated. My brother and sister-in-law forcibly quit their mother from the room. I've no time for someone so cruel and thoughtless. How dare you put yourself above Kelly and the baby? You don't deserve to be a part of this family. Yeah, I agree. Your birthday present this year is that you never have to see Kelly again, nor will you ever see me again. Or me. I've no interest in spending time with someone like you. Six months later, we hadn't heard from the mother-in-law, and we were pregnant again. My heart still hurt for the life we lost, and I knew I would never forgive my mother-in-law, but she got what she deserved. She killed my baby, and she lost her family in return. I hope she's miserable. My brother and sister-in-law often come around to spend time with us, and recently my sister-in-law told us she will be getting married soon. It's a pity that my mother-in-law won't be around to witness this happy event or to ruin it. We hear that she now lives with her cat and is getting really old. Her bad attitude and the fact that she looks down on people have probably driven away her close friends. I sometimes feel pity for her. Thanks for watching. Please like the video so it can be recommended to others. My name is Juno, and I haven't had the easiest life. Growing up, my parents always treated my older brother Jeff and me differently. While I would get scolded for anything that I did, he was always praised. If he broke something, my parents would blame me, even if it was obvious that I had done nothing wrong. They always favored Jeff because he was smart and looked exactly like our father, whereas I didn't look like either of my parents. Even when we occasionally got into fights, our parents always would take Jeff's side despite the fact that most of the time, he would hit me, and I never retaliated. My family owned a corporation that manufactured car parts, and my father was the CEO while my mother handled the finances. Even though they made good money, I knew that they would never pay for my college tuition, so I made plans to find a job once I graduated high school. I knew that it would be hard for me to make enough money to live off of and go to school, but I also knew that it would be worth it. But then, one day my parents came home and sat me down. Listen, Juno, your mother and I have made a decision about your future. My heart skipped a beat. I was skeptical about what they were going to say, 
but I was also incredibly hopeful that they might tell me that they would pay for my schooling. Yes, this is very good news. You are young, but we have made arrangements for you to be married. You can't be serious? How could you do this to me? Oh, we are serious and you've been useless. This arranged marriage will benefit our company as we are marrying you to the niece of the owner of Timo Corporation. They are one of our biggest clients. But I'm 18. What if I don't love this woman? What's the problem? I assumed you would be interested in being set up with an older woman. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But the next day, they told me to clean up and then get dressed in a brand new suit that they had bought for me, looking in the mirror. I was amazed to see how well it fit and how distinguished it made me look. They even bought me hair products and cologne to use. Later that day, we drove over to a mansion with a tall gate surrounding it. Once inside, we were escorted to a room where a large woman was sitting waiting for us. Hello there. Oh my, but aren't you the handsome young man? You will be marrying my niece Kendra, although I'm sure she wouldn't mind if I had a bit of fun with you too. So then this will make things between our companies square. Yes, yes. I will sign off on the contracts and give you more work, and the debt that you accumulated will be forgiven as well. I wouldn't normally let so much money go, but hopefully this handsome and energetic young man will make up for it. I can't wait to get him upstairs. I was mortified. I had never met a woman who was so lecherous. Shocked, I tried to get my parents' attention so that I could get out of this situation, but they ignored me. Suddenly, a pair of security guards showed up and escorted me to a large room on the second floor. Once we were alone, Beatrice began to act even more inappropriately. Oh yes, you are a handsome thing. She slowly began to approach me, and I didn't like the look in her eyes. Just before she was about to lay a hand on me, though, I heard a call through the door. Hello, Aunt Beatrice, are you in there? Oh, damn. Well, young man, maybe we'll have some fun later. Yes, Kendra, please come in. Hello, um, who is this? This is your new husband. Husband, are you serious? Yes, it's well past time that you were married. People will think something is wrong with you that you are 25 and unmarried. Um, what is your name and how old are you? My name is Juno and I'm 18. 18? Aunt Beatrice, are you crazy? What's the problem? He is young and full of energy and he's handsome as well. If you're truly unhappy, then just enjoy him for a few years and then find someone else. I can't believe you. That's the reason that you've never been married. You treat men like napkins. You use them and discard them without a care in the world. I didn't know what to say, but the way that Kendra looked at her aunt, I knew that something was up. They had a very strained relationship. I was worried that Kendra would be very similar to her aunt, but over the next few months as I got to know her, she was actually very kind and had a good heart. Some nights she would come home late from work and I would prepare a meal and we would talk the whole night about our interests and what we did that day. I found her work so incredibly fascinating and I admired her work ethic. Slowly we got to know each other and found out that we had the same taste in music, books, and TV shows. Although it had been arranged against my will, I was actually beginning to fall for Kendra. I later found out that Kendra's parents had owned the company she worked for, and that they had passed away when she was very young. Her aunt had taken over since she was too young to run the company. Thankfully, Kendra constantly put herself between her aunt and me. More than once, her aunt Beatrice tried to get me alone with her, but Kendra always made sure that it didn't happen. I know some guys would jump at the chance to be with an older woman, but I had no interest in Beatrice, especially since I was falling for Kendra, although I didn't say anything. One day, she came home rather upset, and I tried to comfort her. What's wrong, Kendra? Did you have a bad day? Oh, hello there, Juno. Yeah, it was a really tough one. I wish I could tell you more, but I can't at the moment. But don't worry. I have a plan to make sure that this will be my last tough day. I didn't understand what she meant, and she wouldn't elaborate. It was hard, but I had faith that she knew that what night she was we curled doing. up on the couch and watched movies to relax. A few nights later, I was home alone when I heard the front door open and close. 
Thinking that it was Kendra coming home, I went to greet her and was shocked to see that it was Beatrice. Uh, there's the young man that I want. How did you get in here? I have a spare key, of course. Now come here. My niece can't be the only one that has some fun with you. Stop it. Please, I'm with Kendra and this is wrong. Are you sure? Because if you turn me down, I can end all the contracts with your parents' company and they will go bankrupt. Besides, I always get what I want. Before she could lay a hand on me, Kendra burst into the room. Stop it, aunt. No, I will not. How dare you deny me what I want? I'm your boss, and if I hadn't taken care of you after your parents passed away, then you would be on the street. That won't fly anymore. As of this afternoon, the board of trustees voted you out. You've kept me from taking over the company for too long. They chose me to replace you. You can't be serious. I won't allow you to take the company from me. You have no say in the matter. The board discovered all the illicit things you've been up to, bribing, embezzling money, and fraud. I've been waiting for this opportunity for a while. Just then, two police officers came into the room and dragged Beatrice out. It turned out that Kendra had been investigating Beatrice and found that she was doing many illegal things with the company and its money and had worked both with the board of trustees and the police to end her tyranny. As a result, she was finally able to take control of the company as she was supposed to all along. And Juno, I got you this. She hesitantly pulled divorce papers out of a pocket in her suit jacket. I know this isn't the ideal situation for you. With this, you can do whatever you like. To be honest though, that isn't what I want. I would much prefer to stay with you. Are you sure? You don't mind that I'm older and kind of a workaholic? Not at all. The time that we've spent together has made me realize that I have fallen in love with you. I could tell by the look in her eyes that she felt the same and with joy, she tore up the paperwork and we kissed. The months that followed were filled with a lot of hard work. Kendra made it her mission to clean up the company and remove all of the illegal activity that her aunt had been involved in. Part of that affected my family's business as well though. It turned out that they were involved in a lot of bribery and Kendra refused to do business with them anymore. My parents tried to call me and get me to convince Kendra to change her mind, but I blocked their number and ignored them. There was no way that I was going to jeopardize my marriage for them. After all, they sold me off, and even though it was turning out to be the best thing to ever happen to me, I still resented them for it. Months later, I found out that they ended up having to sell off their company as they were bankrupt and were forced to even sell their home as well. The last thing that I heard was that they were buried in debt and that both my parents and brother were living paycheck to paycheck in a small dirty apartment in a bad neighborhood. And as for Beatrice, well, she was sentenced to 20 years in prison for all the crimes that she had committed. As for me, Kendra paid for me to go to college, and after I graduated, I joined her company as an accountant and eventually worked my way up to be the head of finances. It was quite rewarding. And even though my wife owned the company, I was never shown favoritism and had to work hard to prove myself, which I found rewarding. Today, we couldn't be happier. And not only has our company grown, but our family has as well. We have a wonderful son and are expecting a daughter any day now. Thanks for watching. Please like the video for the algorithm. Hi there, my name is Sharon. I've never considered myself to be a lucky person. I've had a very complicated upbringing. Let me tell you what happened so that you can have a better understanding of what I mean. When I was very young, my dad abandoned my mom and left her to raise my brother Martin and me all by herself. He was there one day and the next. He emptied out their bank accounts and then just disappeared. He didn't even leave her with anything other than crippling debt. And sadly, the stress from all that debt combined with the fact that my father had always been the breadwinner of the house sent my mom into a depression which eventually caused her to commit suicide. The years afterwards weren't easy, but my brother stepped up and did a lot of hard work. Now I live with my brother Martin, who is my legal guardian. He dropped out of high school, so it wasn't easy for him to find a good job. 
but he worked tirelessly day and night to provide for me. There were even times where he worked more than one job just so that we could live comfortable lives. When I was old enough, I did manage to find a college that would accept me, but sadly, even though we were incredibly poor, I wasn't able to obtain any scholarships. And so during college, I worked at a restaurant to help pay for my tuition. You should take out a student loan or get a scholarship. It would be so much easier than working and going to school full time. But I didn't want to go into debt like my parents. My mom committed suicide because of her debt. And I was worried that the same would happen to me. After a long talk, I convinced him that I knew what I was doing and that I had a plan to make things work. Years later, I am now married to my husband, Tate. And I work as a childcare worker. I stopped working at the restaurant, but I still hang out with my friends from there from time to time. When I got married to Tate, I told him everything that had happened in my past, and he was very understanding. He had grown up in a loving and nurturing home, and so it was hard for him to fully understand the pain that I had gone through. But he definitely did listen and was proud of how far Martin and I had come, considering the hand that we were dealt. Not long afterwards, we had a son, and although life was still challenging, it was also really good. But two years later, Tate's parents and his sister came into the picture. They were such jerks. They called me all kinds of names because I was an orphan and would often make jokes about my current and former job. Not only that, they also came after my brother, calling him all kinds of names because he didn't have a good job and dropped out of school to support me. Martin is my guardian, so not only was I angry that they laughed at me, but I was also angry because they spoke poorly of Martin as well. Tate protected me from them the best he could, but he could only do so much. His parents owned a local grocery shop, and they all went to good universities, always bragging about how successful their business was. But the truth was, it wasn't doing so well, and I knew it. Despite their financial troubles, they spent money freely and bought lavish gifts for themselves, and always asked me for money making it sound like I was obligated to pay them. Eventually, they had to move in with us after their house caught fire and they lost their home overnight. They were terrible guests. While I didn't expect them to do most of the work around the house, I did expect them to help out at least a little bit, but they didn't do anything around the house and treated me like a maid. Even though my mother-in-law stayed home all day and didn't move or do anything, then when I came home from work, she just called me names and complained about how dirty the house was. Whenever I bought stuff for my son and put it in the fridge, they ate it without asking, and they didn't even pay for any of the food that they ate. I had had enough and tried to tell Tate that I was nearing the end of my patience with them. He talked to them for me, but it wasn't enough. They made a little effort for a couple of days, but then went right back to the same routine. One day, while I was returning home from work during winter season, I saw something unbelievable. When I got home, I heard the sounds of people laughing and walked towards where I heard the sounds coming from. In the living room, I saw my mother-in-law and sister-in-law staring through the window. Apparently, they had locked my son outside in the cold weather while it was snowing very hard. My son was freezing and was desperate to come back into the house, but they just kept staring and laughing at the poor boy. I was furious at my husband for allowing this kind of evil behavior to continue to occur in our house. It was bad enough for them to treat me like garbage, but for them to actively abuse my son, that was too much. As far as I was concerned, my husband was enabling them, allowing them to be as toxic as they wanted to be, and I was done with him. If he couldn't be bothered to defend his own family against his cruel parents and sister, then I decided to get a divorce, but that wasn't enough. I decided to get some sweet revenge at the same time, and so I started preparing and forming some plans. My son and I weren't spending another day with those jerks. I went to talk to my brother and his wife and asked them if it was okay for me to leave my son with them for a while until I took care of things back at home. Then I told my husband that my brother and his wife were going on a short vacation with their kids and that I wanted them to take our son. He believed me. Next, I closed my bank account and withdrew all the money, which I then placed in a safe to prevent my husband from accessing it during the divorce proceedings. I also convinced my husband to take out a second mortgage to buy me a car, despite the fact that we were still paying for our house. I was fully aware that this would leave him with two mortgages to pay, potentially causing him financial strain. 
Finally, I hired a good lawyer and went to a detective agency to prepare for the divorce trial. A few weeks later, my in-laws were charged with tax fraud. Apparently, they had been evading taxes in their shop. Then I brought in my lawyer and told him I wanted a divorce. They needed my money, but my bank account was gone, and all my money was hidden somewhere safe. They looked, but they couldn't find any. They wanted to hire someone to look for it, but they couldn't afford it. The house was under Tate's name, and it was already paid for. I paid for some of it too, so I didn't want to give it up, but it was a small price to pay to get them out of my life. Tate started crying and begged me to forgive him, but I left him. I told him he didn't have to pay for damages or child support if he promised me to never show his face in front of me or my son again. I got it all in writing. It took a while, but finally I was done. It felt quite nice. His parents were pissed, but they couldn't do anything about it. And they're still up to their necks in debt even to this very day. They treated me like crap all these years. But finally, I got my revenge. I now live happily with my son far away from ex and my ex-in-laws. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Claire, and my family is very toxic. For starters, my parents would constantly try to pit my siblings against each other. We were forced to compete for their love and attention. If one of us got lower grades than the other two, they would belittle them and make them feel inferior. For sports, whoever did the worst would be yelled at and usually punished by being slapped. My parents thought that this would toughen us up and that by being forced to compete with one another, that it would make us stronger and more resilient, but all it really did was make us feel unloved and untrusting of each other. However, my younger brother Josh decided one day that he would no longer play our parents' insane games, and not long after I followed suit which made both our mother and father very upset with us. They could tell that they were losing power over us, and so they doubled their efforts, and while it stung every time that they would abuse us, both of us decided that we would stick to our guns and chose to support each other and just ignore them. We figured that we would only have to put up with them until we were 18, and then we would be on our own and would no longer have to put up with them. Our eldest sister, Vanessa, though, continued to berate us and did her best to keep trying to win our parents' love. She hadn't come to realize that they didn't love us and were only playing games with our love and attention. Once our parents realized that my brother and I would no longer compete with Vanessa for their approval, they began to focus only on Vanessa and no matter what she asked for, they would give it to her. She had the nicest of clothes and had every toy she could ever want. And when she got older, they would pay to have her in every class or play on any sports team that she wanted to join. My mom will neglect me and won't even buy me pads. My parents never yelled at Vanessa and will celebrate all her birthdays, whereas I and my Josh will get nothing. It was so incredibly unfair as Josh and I had to struggle for everything that we needed or wanted. Mom and dad, can I please have $20 so that I can join the science team after school? The money will be used to buy materials to do experiments with. It will really help me to do better in chemistry and biology. That's outrageous. We aren't made of money. If you want the money, then you should get a job. But I'm not old enough to get a job. Shut up. Girls in other countries your age are married and working. You are just lazy. Oh, daddy, I need $100. Of course, my dear. Here you are. Have lots of fun. But you didn't even ask what it was for. That's so unfair. How dare you talk back to me? Go to your room. You're grounded. No matter what I asked for, it would always end that way. For years, Josh and I struggled while Vanessa was given everything that she ever needed. That is until I graduated from high school. I knew that our parents wouldn't spare a single dollar for my college, and so I just applied for financial assistance and was accepted. Leaving for school was such a wonderful relief, although I felt guilty that Josh still had to endure a few more years living in our parents' home before he too could leave and go to school. After I graduated college, I began looking for work and managed to find work as a freelance writer. The pay wasn't much, but it allowed me to get my own place. And so I moved out from my parents' home and felt such relief knowing that I wouldn't have to live with them and their abuse anymore. When I was about living our house, my mom was so happy and said, Make sure to send us money, okay? Now that you going, Vanessa can use your room to keep some of her dresses. I didn't say anything and just left. A couple of years later, Josh graduated from business college and I offered for him to move in with me. 
Are you sure, Claire? I wouldn't want to impose. Of course. Besides, it wouldn't be permanent. It would just be until you can get yourself settled. Plus, I feel guilty for leaving you alone in that house with our terrible parents. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I do appreciate it. I just need to find myself a job like yours and start making some money. Well, I don't make that much. I would love to have the book I wrote publish it, though. Maybe that would make me rich. The two of us laughed, but then Josh got very serious. Well, why don't you try to do it actually? As a thank you for letting me stay with you, I could help find companies interested in publishing your book, and I could even find you signing gigs. I could be like your manager. What do you say? I mean, it didn't hurt, and if Josh really wanted to, I was willing to trust him and let him give it a try. And so, he got to work finding a company to make my book a reality, and after a few rejections, he found one that was interested. They gave me a huge signing bonus and offered me a contract to write five more books. I still have no idea how Josh managed to get that amazing deal, but it was the start of my career as an author. Josh was also offered a job by the company as well. A couple years later, I managed to buy myself a large house and had Josh move in with me while he looked for one for himself. It was a dream come true, and the two of us were so happy. That is until Vanessa came to visit. How on earth did you two losers afford such an amazing home? Did you become criminals or something? No, Vanessa. Claire is an amazing author, and I've been managing her. We're adults now. Why are you still so mean? You do realize that mom and dad aren't even here, right? There's no one here for you to impress. Oh, them. Yeah, I don't have a use for them anymore. Listen, when can I move in? What do you mean? Well, mom and dad don't have any more money and they're being too strict, so obviously I need to move in with you two losers. As it turned out, Vanessa had tried several times to go to college and had our parents pay for classes every time. When she failed, she would then just apply and take a different course, racking up massive amounts of debt as she did so. Since our parents were paying, they began to get overwhelmed with the debt and could barely afford their mortgage, let alone the growing debt that Vanessa was accumulating. Finally, they told her that she needed to start paying for things as well and that they would force her to live on a very strict budget. Vanessa, however, refused to do so and had decided that either Josh or I would just let her move in with us so that she could continue to live like she had gotten used to. Your family and you both have money, so it's your responsibility to help me. No, Vanessa, we don't need to help you. You're an adult. You need to figure this out on your own. Vanessa began to start crying and began to get angry. She couldn't understand why we wouldn't just give in like our parents always used to, and after asking her to leave a dozen times, we were forced to threaten to call the police and have her removed as a trespasser. After she left, the two of us called up our parents to see what had happened. They were incredibly desperate and begged us both to help them, or else they would have to file for bankruptcy and end up losing their house. Please, you two need to help us. Your older sister has bankrupted us and we are desperate. And why would we? You were terrible to us. You gave Vanessa everything and never cared about us until now that we've made it. Yes, exactly. The two of you are rich now. You can help us out. Are you insane? Nope, you never helped us. We had to do everything, just the two of us. And why would we? You were terrible to us. You gave Vanessa everything and never cared about us until now that we've made it. And so, we hung up on them. Part of me felt a bit guilty, but they had chosen to support only Vanessa, and they could have put a stop to enabling her bad behavior at any time and hadn't. It wasn't our fault that they didn't want to be responsible parents. After we hung up the phone, though, Josh began to grin devilishly, and I couldn't help but wonder why. A few weeks later, he invited me to go for a drive with him. Where are we going? I have a wonderful surprise. I finally found a house that I wanted to buy. As he spoke, we pulled up in front of our parents' house. Josh had managed to buy it once the bank repossessed it from our parents. Why did you buy it? Revenge. So many bad memories were made in this place for us, and I wanted to give the house a chance to create some good memories for me instead. But what about Vanessa and our parents? As it turned out, Josh had filed a restraining order against them so that they couldn't go anywhere near his house. As it was, Vanessa and our parents had been forced to move into a tiny bachelor pad together. Every so often, they would try to call and beg us for money, but we would just let their calls go to voicemail and never answered them. The three of them were miserable and constantly fought but had no choice but to continue to live together as they tried to climb their way out of debt. Not long after moving into his new house, 
Josh met a girl and ended up getting married and having three wonderful children there, filling the home with good memories. Not long after his first child was born, I too got married and I'm happy to say that I am pregnant and am expecting my daughter to be born any day. Both Josh and I would never have guessed that we would escape from our toxic family, but we're truly glad that we did and we're given the chance to make a whole new family, even if we had to cut out our parents and older sister to do it. Thanks for watching. Please like and share the video.